So, hi everybody, I'm Jana Clemens. I came to my understanding of dyslexia through dealing with my own family. It hadn't ever occurred to me that I was dyslexic and I've currently uh, reached that conclusion and started to notice all sorts of little things that I sometimes do when I'm not focusing. Uh, unlike um, some of the other self-directed education theorists, I solidly believe that dyslexia is a neurotype that does exist. I just think it's got the wrong name because it's not a problem with reading at all. It's actually a talent profile. And my experience has been that the reading problems that often are associated with dyslexia aren't necessary and only come into play with certain approaches to education and certain circumstances. So I would like to share what I can today um, to support other people in supporting young people because really dyslexic kids in the words of Jamie Oliver the famous British chef who is dyslexic the response to any child being diagnosed dyslexic should really be one of congratulations how lucky you are um, rather than anything else and with that for now I'll hand over to my conversation companion thank you first of all thank you for having me my name is Nikolai and I work as an educator and family therapist for more than 20 years. Freelance in schools, in teaching uh, parents and also teachers, mostly in German speaking countries, but also in uh, English speaking countries. My English is a little bit rusty because I haven't talked for a while in English because right now I'm in Germany. So actually, my journey began when I was a child in grammar school and my original plan was to become a priest in a Catholic church. And you must know this decision was not based upon Christian Catholic preaching or something. It was the atmosphere in this church, I felt. My parents were supportive and happy to enroll me in a Catholic boarding school. I had to take an entry examination. The results were quite good, but I made many spelling mistakes. So they told me I could not be admitted. My world fell totally apart. I was 11 years old and I knew I would be a good priest because this depends on more than reading and writing more important things. This experience rubbed me off any future perspective, to be honest. My school grades got bad, the circle of my friends changed, and I now surround, surrounded myself with bad boys. We rebelled against false authorities, we stole stuff from department stores, and broke other laws. Yeah, so my parents uh, intervened. I became an uh, electronic engineer, but that wasn't mine. And so I sold my company and started traveling around. And then uh, to make it short, I find my way to find out how to support children to read and write error-free. And now I support children to not come into the same situation because of reading and writing challenges as I have been in that time. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's very beautiful. And I'm so glad that you did find your way. And this is a very, very common story. This is what drove me to write um, What If School Creates Dyslexia was seeing exactly this, that we've got this amazing dyslexic dyslexia talent and and i really think we need to workshop a, a new a new word for it but you have a child with so much potential um, with so much good intent heading in a beautiful direction and then we confront the situation of a disproportionate number of children in uh, juvenile detention and adults in jail disproportionate number um, are dyslexic and I believe that's very much because of this erosion of self-esteem that you are talking about, that you, you then felt not good enough anymore um, when actually you were very talented. Yeah, absolutely. So I am curious, you have got 
a method that you use to assist young people with spelling, particularly as well, because I've I've always had the perspective that, and, and, and this exploration is new for me, that the reading problems are absolutely unnecessary and can be simply avoided by taking away the pressure to learn to read in a particular way, according to particular methods at a particular time, with a lot of stakes attached. That when children are told, you have to learn to read right now, because otherwise you'll fall behind. And, and this is how you learn to read. That while many children can manage that, those with this beautiful talent profile are usually only ready to learn later, maybe at 11, maybe 12, sometimes nine, sometimes even as late as 15. And that's when their brains are actually ready. And I look at that, my theory is that it's similar to children learning um, multiple languages in a household. Mul multilingual children often learn to speak a little later because their brains are busy coordinating the different languages. And a dyslexic brain has this capacity for quite beautiful multi-level processing. And it seems to be that it takes a while to coordinate all of these different levels and be ready to, to deal with, with the reading. And then when they're given a method that doesn't work for them, dyslexic brains are very, very creative, amazingly creative. So to be given somebody else's method that doesn't fit with you, and then you try to do it that way, going against your natural way of doing it, makes it harder and makes you start doubting yourself. And then being given a pressure and high stakes makes it frightening. Getting the impression that you're stupid makes you give up and, and lowers your motivation. And then you actually start to believe that there's a problem. And believing that there's a problem makes you try harder. And what I've seen in my own life and the, and the kids around me is that when um, a dyslexic brain tries hard, it does this. It engages all of its gears and it tries even harder. And that's actually going to make this flat uh, two-dimensional text do the wrong things, that what one has to do is actually relax. But I've previously said you'll still know them by their spelling. And it seems that uh, you've also um, come across ways that you can support young people in getting past even that. Would you like to talk a little bit about uh, what you've been doing? Yes, of course. Well, what I teach is I support children actually in three parts. First, to become aware of their own learning strategy, their mindset they use when they read and write. They don't know that, actually, yeah, the, or most of them. The second part is to become aware of how the children who read and write fluent and error-free store words, text they see on the whiteboard or in the book, how they store that in their mind. They don't know that mostly also not and of course the words they hear from the teacher or from the outside how they store this part in their mind yeah to become aware of their mindset the mindset of the children of the people who are fluent and error free in reading and writing yeah and then they recognize that they also possess the thinking strategy. And then I support them to use their mind to be able, equally successful. For that, I don't give them any answers. I just ask them intelligent questions so that the child recognizes this true self-reflection. This creates then an aha effect. That's how they do it. Well, that's, I can do that also, yeah? What I believe is relearning. My experience with, meanwhile, really thousands of children, because I do this work since 1996, I would say, in schools, unschoolers, homeschoolers, or any other settings, has shown every child I have seen or worked with is able to achieve this. We all have the same brain, and what one human being can do, any human being can do. That's what I believe. 
I include also, of course, holistic approaches, like you were saying, to strengthen the ability to concentrate, to relax, and to increase self-esteem or help by family or by social disadvantages, but can sometimes have a very negative impact on learning strategy. And, uh, you know, I have identified about four courses for dyslexia. The first is, as I already said, the unconscious use of an ineffective learning strategy, a mindset that is inappropriate to learn how to read and write, influenced the unconscious use of an ineffective learning strategy. That's what I mean. An ineffective mindset. What is inappropriate? Inappropriate. <laughs> I'm sorry, my English. To learn. You should hear if I had to do this in German. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> to learn how to read and write fluent and error free. These children are bound to fail if they don't know how to use their mind in the right way. To say it short, they're bound to fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Memorizing written words phonetically causes, out of my experience, dyslexia. Of course, the word that's heard is taught phonetically, but the visual part of it needs to be stored visual. We can go into that a little later. Yeah. And I think that's where the spelling would come in because, again, having the creative dyslexic brain, the dyslexic kids that I know are amazing spellers. They come up with the most fantastic spellings. It's just that, again, we're living in this world that wants to only do things one way. I'm curious how you came to how you came to your understanding of the nature of dyslexia. For me, it was firstly watching my own child um, sort out his dyslexia. When I had realized that he was dyslexic and then I, I went searching for what we were going to do to help him. And I read a book by Ron Davis called, I think, Gifted Dyslexic. Because until then, everything I'd come across had been very negative, very um, pathologizing about dyslexia being a problem. And I wasn't relating well to it. And that was the first time I'd actually seen somebody talking about dyslexia in the positive as a talent. And so I was attracted to find out, well, what was the method that was offered by somebody with this attitude? And I was researching it. I took my son to an introductory lecture um, by somebody practicing this method. And I was just thinking, how the heck am I going to afford this? And then I thought, well, look, we, we do self-directed education because we were already doing that, luckily, um, which also took away the pressure. It was my pressure. He wasn't actually under any pressure to learn to read right now. I was the one who thought, oh, well, he's trying and he's stuck and I have to help him because he's dyslexic and he won't be able to do anything without help. And um, then I thought, well, let me ask him, would you like me to tell you about the book that I've read and everything in it that goes along with this introductory talk. And he was like, yeah. Then I explained to everything him everything that I'd read. And he translated it into his own words. And he said, oh, because he was very into engineering um, and physics. Uh, oh, you're telling me that I need to change gears in order to read. And I was like, well, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. He was like, okay. And then he started reading. And then as he got tired, he started to make his errors again. And I said, I think you've slipped gears. He was like, oh, okay. And he changed back again. And a couple of months later, he was reading his way through the Harry Potter, Potter series after sort of having started at CAT. And that was a big wow for me. And I thought, wow, okay, what's going on here? And then I came across the information from Sudbury Valley School, which has uh, been open more than 52 years now. And Daniel Greenberg's statement that he's never seen a case of dyslexia when we know that this alternative um, facility would have a far higher proportion of dyslexics than most schools because many of them are coming there because other forms of education have failed them. And then I came across Peter Gray's research where he actually quoted two um, separate occasion teenagers who came to Sudbury Valley School at around the age of 15, having been diagnosed as dyslexic and still completely illiterate when they arrived at Sudbury Valley and able to read a couple of months later, having self-taught. And he asked each of them separately in his research, he followed up the question, 
what happened? How did you suddenly become able to read after all this time? And they both had a very similar answer along the lines of nobody expected me to anymore. So there wasn't any pressure. So I could actually now teach myself. And so they were able to use their creative dyslexic talent and the lack of pressure to go about it in their own way. And that seems to be what underlies the lack of dyslexia in a self-directed system is that because there isn't a particular age at which you have to learn and there isn't any uh, falling behind because there's nothing to fall behind in and you can carry on learning and growing and acquiring skills and knowledge without having to do it through text, the children don't get stressed, they don't get anxious, they don't start getting a self-perception of I struggle with reading, which means that when the brain is finally ready and there's been no imposed method, they can find their way and learn how to do it. The problem comes in, and this is where I really like things like your book, the problem comes in when, like you, they've already been exposed to reading lessons. They've already taken the self-esteem damage. And now we have to heal that out and now we have to actually intervene. So how did you actually come to realize that this wasn't an inevitability, that there'd be a problem? Well, actually, I have slightly different experiences. First of all, from my point of view, there is not such thing as a dyslexic mind at all. There's only, as I already said, if a child is not aware of how he needs to use his mindset to learn how to read and write, then he will get a problem. <laughs> Yeah, that's the most important thing, I believe. Yeah. And you're talking a lot about reading. I'm also talking about writing because for me, that is one and is the same base. Yeah. I actually start uh, teaching children to uh, write first and then uh, talk. So that's the first thing. They don't know how to use their mind. And if they don't know how to use their mind, and then in the second part, if they use a mindset what is not helping them to learn to read and write, then they get problems. So that's what I said. First, I help them to find out what mindset does a person use what is fluent in reading and writing without any <laughs> big uh, effort they do it yeah so the second part of course if the child has no interest to learn how to read and write then it doesn't make sense yeah because he's not aware he's not concentrated he's just not interested yeah and that's where the school comes in. In school, the children who need to go to school, they need to learn in a certain time, certain things to read or write. And if they're not aware, if they've got with their mind wandering around, they will fail. Yeah. So that's not working at all, as you said. But I also find out with unschoolers, children in Sudbury schools, because I have actually been part of building up a Sudbury school on Maui a long, long time ago, children who are not in school, they have also a challenge to learn how to read and write. I haven't seen any child who is just saying in in some age oh now i'm interested to learn to read and write and then everything is going to come to him and he is able to read and write all the words he has seen somewhere or heard somewhere and then he's able to read and write all those words perfectly i haven't seen that you really need to sit down and put those words in the right way into their mind that's where we would have a different experience yeah, of so course. I, I watched. My I watched. Is, uh, yeah. It's really based, as I said, on 
my own experience to work with so many children, parents in school and so on for a long time. It's not anything theoretically or so. It's that's what I experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't had any child who wasn't able to read and write if he's interested, if he has, as you're saying, this time to do it in his frame of mind in his time and not being pushed by any outside influences. At the moment, the child get pushed by any outside influence, then he's not there. Then yeah. of course you get problems. Yeah, yeah. So that pushing by the outside influence also um, dents the motivation because then of course it becomes controlled motivation rather than autonomous. And then also the pressure becomes that there's an external reason to learn to read that isn't the child's own reason. But I've had plenty of experience watching children spontaneously learn to read. And there's quite a bit of research also um, in my own country from Renuka Ramrup. And um, in the UK, remind me somebody, um, the researchers in the UK um, who've looked at unschooling children, that spontaneous uh, teaching oneself to read is very, very common. Um, of course, they go through a process. You don't just suddenly wake up one day and 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 you can read. They still go through the process. Yeah. The average child in SDE learns to read without um, formal lessons, basically going through their own process. One of the things that I see very often in SDE is these days there's often an interim layer of learning to read emoji and write emoji and decode that. It's almost like a kind of pictograms, um, which is quite fun. They will often also use text, as you say, writing before they learn to read. Obviously, being read to is very important. Learning about the, the value of story and desiring to, to join in. Um, having their peers help them during the gap when they can't yet read. And then also often you see this kind of peer-to-peer -peer coaching that results in reading. There do seem to be a lot of different ways that children learn to read. My interest in work like yours, and uh, Olive, who's also, I think, uh, here today, who'll have a moment a bit later, is really when there is a child who can't escape into self-directed education, because not every child can escape into self-directed education. And the children who are stuck in a system that that demands that they learn and who are going to keep taking self-esteem knocks until they uh, have learned, I think are the ones who really need uh, the kind of work that you are doing. In self-directed education, it seems to be very rare, but still necessary that sometimes you will have a child who's only going to really be ready to do it by themselves later. And they are now frustrated, sometimes because of peer pressure from cousins who are in regular school or just the messages they've picked up that they ought to be reading by 12 or they've been trying and they personally want to achieve it and they're struggling and those seem to be the times in self-directed education when the child will ask for help and that's where we go looking for um, a qualified facilitator to support them rather than trying to muddle along and support them ourselves when the child is, is really struggling. Yeah, as I said, self-directing education is the best thing at all, of course. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, my experience is not all those children become good spellers or good readers. They mostly find a way around it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's okay. But my job is to help them to become aware, use their mind in the right way, and then it will work out. Let's say it in that way. Maybe um, people who read and write fluently and error free, they all, that's a strong statement I'm making now, they all use more or less the same mindset. Yeah. And that's what people find out from for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, different uh, uh, scientific people and so on and so on. They find that out. Yeah. And, but if the child doesn't know it, 
he, as you say, he may try this and this and this and this and this, and maybe he finds it and it's all fine. But if it finds it, if the child gets, um, how do you say it in English, supported to find out to do it as the good speller and reader do it, then everything becomes very easy. And this starts also in the age of four or five or six years. Right now, as I said, I'm working a lot with um, families who take their child out of the school system. In Germany, it's, it's like a, a, a lot of people, a lot of families moving out of Germany and uh, get them out of the school system and so on and so on. But then they ask themselves now how self-directed uh, uh, learning is fine, but how can I support my child? And the way, what's not really a good way is to buy books with the usual uh, teaching matters of our school system here in Germany, because they made a lot of mistakes in the last 20 years because they tried to have every child read and write as they hear the word, and they didn't provide anymore the word picture. So with the spelling, I think that that's the key, because I know Olive um, also um, works very much with um, the visual of the, the word. And what I've seen with the spelling, with the self-directed -direct kids, the ones whose spelling comes right are the ones who read voraciously. So they're getting a lot of imprints of the word again and again and again and again, visually. And yeah, those tend to yeah. be the ones whose spelling comes right. Otherwise, I can spot the dyslexics with their spelling. The remnant of the dyslexia that I can spot even in myself and often in the parents of the dyslexic kids when they write me emails is the leaving out of the little words when people are under pressure. That's the one remnant that I can spot every time is that you'll suddenly lose your ofs and your ases um, and your ins and your ats they'll just evaporate. And that seems to really come along with it, which is one of the reasons I do believe in a dyslexic mind, but we'll agree to disagree on that. I know Peter Gray also shares your stance very much there, but I do find it significant that you can measure not only a disproportionate number of dyslexics in the prison system, but also in NASA and also in the secret services. And I would challenge you that if there's no particular neurotype there, why would we see a disproportionate level uh, on the strength end in certain professions where a lot of multidimensional processing and creativity is necessary, like, for example, um, aerospace design and engineering? Do you have any thoughts on that or shall we go somewhere else? Uh, well, the only thing I can say for that is they're working around. They, they find different ways, different talents, different shops or something like this so they're working around that's what i find out um there was some more thing i was trying to say uh, how to use around yeah that's the only thing i can think of right so i'm thinking we should maybe go to some practical advice for people watching would you like to say a little bit practical to give people an idea uh briefly about your approach yeah. yeah of course what can they do to help their child yeah right of course i try to make it very simple i have a book on that in english language that's uh, i wrote that about i would say five years ago and in german language i just made a new book and uh, but in short as i said i start with reading i believe first you have the child or whoever needs to put his word image in his mind so how how the word is written i use mostly the word daughter in germany because even in english it's different written than spoken right so show your child a word yeah and now let's start a little bit earlier first of all help your child to imagine his uh, bike, let's say. Most children have bikes, right? So imagine your bike, maybe 
throw it a little bit in front of you. And then the second step, imagine your name. The most children know their name. If they don't know, then have the no name written and then just write it in the air. And now something very special comes into it. Write it always from the back side. So the last letters, then the second last. So from back to forward. Why? Because many children are used to read the word and spell it out. So they do the phonetic part on it. And then they try to spell it phonetically. If you do it backwards, that's not working. And this really helps you to create the word picture. Okay. So the second thing is, it depends how old the child, how old the child is. He maybe can only see three or four letters. So you help the child to see more words at the same time. I start with the simple exercise of holding your eyes straight and just see as you move your uh, thumbs away. Yeah, this helps. Yeah. And then he's able to see the whole word and can spell it backwards or different letters, uh, the second from the front, the second from the past, and so on and so on. If he has this mind pictures really settled in his mind, then let him write it down on paper. Just get the image, the word image down on paper, see it on the paper. I see like in Harry Potter, uh, secret language or so. You see it, but it's not written yet on the paper and then just write it down. So, and then after this is really successful, if he's really able to see the word in front of him, and have it written down arrow free, then the phonetic part comes into it. So then you ask the child to look on his mind picture, the daughter, yeah, or it's written, of course, and then you tell him how the word is uh, it's pronounced. So you say daughter, and in front of his mental picture, he has to D H U G H T E R, I believe, or R E T H G U R D, I believe that's backwards. Yeah. And then he has both in his mind. Whenever he sees the picture of daughter, the picture shows up and the mind tells him this word is, is pronounced daughter and the other way. And then you go to the next word and, and so on and so on. Then it becomes automatically. And then the child is really able to do this process with any word in a very short time. And then you have a sentence. And after you have the whole sentence in your mind, then this the grammar comes in or the meaning of the word. And of course, the, the meaning of the word comes as soon you have the daughter in, 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 uh, in your mind stored and you say, well, daughter is da da da, if the child doesn't know. But yeah, so first the picture, then the auditory, then um, the grammar and the meaning in that mm -hmm. way. So Olive Tur, she says to me here, yeah, you are right, pictures then name to scaffold their great visual skills. So, Olive, if you can quickly, I think I've managed to ask you to unmute. Hi. Hello, and welcome, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I've, be, I've been doing something very similar to um, what Nikolai has been talking about. So, I'm really excited by this because somebody else in the world going along the same route. I've, I'm on a slightly different trajectory, is that I'm starting from the same place and I'm ending up in the same place. But the route to get there is slightly different, but only slightly different. And so I'm, I've been doing this because of my own spelling and reading problems, which I discovered 20 years ago. But, and so I've been doing this for the last 22 years and teaching everybody else. And there is so much in what you've been saying, which is absolutely great. And I, but I would like to pick out one thing, which is the 
self-directed learning approach and saying that I realised that children can learn on their own. My own son managed to learn to read completely on his own. Um, and But I also see things like frustration coming in. And when I look back on my childhood, not being able to read is a real sad thing when, for me because I missed out on all the children's novels completely. Mm. It wasn't until I started learning, as I got better at reading and learned to read to my son that I could actually start to enjoy reading a book, which took me 40 years. Mm. So I, and I think what Nicola is talking about and what I do is absolutely perfect for helping children Start with their incredible visual strengths, which you were talking about earlier. And these kids have got amazing visual strengths. So let's help them use those visual strengths to scaffold something else. So the first step, as Nikolai said, is to get them talking about their mental images. And the next step is to get them to visualize something like their name. And then the next step is to visualize other nouns which might be stuck on the wall or stuck on pictures on the wall. Or I made up a set of cards for my uh, granddaughter the other day with just words written on them with like a picture of a cat and a cat written across it. And I, wasn't, and I said to her mother, I don't want her to be tested on is that the word cat. I just want her to start associating the word with the object. And you won't know whether she's doing that until she's, until she's older. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm really excited by this. Thank you. And I'd love to talk to Nikolai at a later date, please. Yeah, I thought you the two of you might like to meet and compare notes. Yeah. So interestingly, Bianca in Germany, who teaches English, is also saying that this is a method that's used for um, foreign language learning as well, that this is how German kids learn to speak English too, which makes a lot of sense. And um, of course, we've got a problem with English. It's not a phonetic language. Not at all. Yeah, no, And we are teaching difficult. kids phonics only. This mm. is, to my mind, this is yeah. lunacy. So phonics is useful when you encounter a completely new word that you've never met Absolutely. before to have a go phonetically. Yep. Because often it does give you um, help. And I want to just flag the fact that the two of you have come up with a very similar method but it is some slight differences. And it's completely different to Ron Davis's method. And it's completely different to some other people's methods. And this is where, for me, personally, the self-directed education path is the absolute best of all. Because I even have now met an artist, an artist who cannot mentally visualize at all. And I remember when I chatted with you, Olive, you said, um, the first thing you said to me is, can you have, men do you have mental pictures? And I said, yes. And you said, okay, well, then we're fine. But there will be the occasional child who doesn't. Right. Uh, can I, and and can this I, is where I, sometimes finding their own way is going to be necessary, more I, necessary for the outliers sometimes um, than we would imagine. Can I add something to that? I mm. found a piece of research that said all four-year-olds are, 98% of four-year-olds are creative geniuses. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a four-year-old, then you probably realize they're a creative genius. The only problem is, and this was a piece of research from NASA, is that by the time they're adults, only 2% are creative geniuses. And so what's happening in between? They're losing their creativity, apart oh. from the dyslexics who are managing to keep their creativity almost to the exclusion of being able to read. Yeah. So this is my other worry, because what I see happening when we overemphasize the need to read when a child isn't necess um, necessarily ready or interested is that we channel their effort away from what actually uh, might be their main strengths. So there's an yeah. enormous time and opportunity cost when a child has to put a lot of extra effort into learning to read. And ironically, the very child who needs to be developing their talent, which is how they're going to live and get their self-esteem and have their career, and they need to be spending time on that, gets taken away from all of those interesting things that they would be doing to get shoved into a whole lot of remedial hours, which they maybe aren't ready for and which can also lower their self-esteem. 
in my What If School Creates Dyslexia book, you'll also find a link to a really um, beautiful video discussion that we did, I think, Max, was it the year before last for Dyslexia Week, between Justine, um, who's a, a remedial reading therapist in the USA, who I was hoping to highlight, but she's just had a baby. She said, she, she can't take on clients right now, but maybe in another year, we'll be able to link you up with Justine. She also does completely self-directed, compatible support for reading in the USA. And she might be able to suggest other people if anybody's looking for somebody. Right. And that conversation between herself and another remedial teacher coming out of the mainstream uh, in the self-directed ed um, education direction is very poignant because it's the two of them realizing that the key to helping a child is consent because when the help is imposed on the child, the self-esteem takes a knock that actually makes it not worth the gain in the reading because it doesn't help you to be a fluent reader with no self-confidence. It helps you more to be a non-fluent reader with intact, intact confidence. One of my ahas that I wrote about yeah, in my little booklet was coming across um, the study on successful dyslexic men. If we go over that phrase slowly, success, sorry, sorry, successful illiterate men. If we go over that phrase slowly, to be both illiterate and successful. These were men who are supporting their families, have a house and a car. Most people don't know that they can't read. And they were trying to survey why don't these men come back to the second session of the adult education reading class. And they eventually discovered it was because they were treating them in a condescending way, because these are men who are successful. They're powerful in their lives. And what these men said is that they didn't really have a problem not being able to read. They had a problem with the social stigma when people found out that they couldn't read. So we really need to attack this myth that you will live under a bridge if you can't read. We also need to attack the myth that unless you get taught early, you will not manage to read. That unless you get taught by a specific method at a specific time and you have to keep up and catch up, you won't be able to make anything of your life. We need to attack all of these myths and actually um, set our, and I'll keep saying it, our amazingly creative dyslexic kids free to actually thrive and flourish and fulfill their talents. Yeah, now to, to that point, in, in a previous conversation with Nikolai, we talked a bit about um, how the dyslexics associations and all the therapies, what they are doing and how that is not actually always very helpful and the difference to what, for example, Nikolai and Olive offer, have to offer. And uh, maybe Nikolai, could you quickly talk a little bit about that? Okay. First, I want to just finish um, what Jenna was saying out of my perspective. Self-directed learning is necessary. Of course, going into school will shut down your creativity because you have to learn what is presented from the outside that's that's not working at all we know that yeah but the next step is also the expectations and demands and demands of parents and their fears what they put on to the child that's what i experienced very often with parents who take their children out of school and they don't want them to be taught what the school system teach them. But then they supplement this with their own ideas what the child should learn and when the child should learn something like this. Yeah. So that's the same avenue what's not working to trust the child, as you were saying, to find his own way, his own talents, and then to uh, uh, find, yeah, to, to create his own life. Then he becomes peaceful and socially and so on and so on, and not trying to put people away. So, of course, that's, that's, that, that's, that's the base. That's, of course, very important. And then, just the last sentence, if they know how to use their mind to be able to read and write fluent and, and error-free. They know this, this concept, 
they won't get any reading and writing problems. That's what I'm why I'm doing my work because as I went through this whole stuff in early years, yeah. So this is uh, just I want to want to finish up that thing now. Okay, about the dyslexic association, I um, talk about this in Germany. Actually, we have to go back to the year 2000. By then, I had already successfully integrated my teaching concept at several schools. The dyslexic rate dropped quite big time down. The teacher training and further education institutions saw the success of, of what I did. And we actually plan to integrate the teaching concept into the basic school curriculum for elementary schools. This was around 2000. But then, out of the blue, the Ministry of Education in Bavaria, where I lived at that time, decided to change the teaching methods in a completely different direction. From the year 2000 onwards, elementary school students were only presented with the vocabulary, vocabulary in spoken form. So the, the word image was no longer displayed. Phonetic reading and writing instruction was introduced. In, in, in Deutsch, they learned that they said, uh, schreib wie du sprichst, write as you speak the word, and so on and so on. And the same thing for reading, just use the, um, the si si what is the, the part of a word, the syllables? Uh, how do you say Syllable. Mm. Syllables, thank you. <laughs> Read it in syllables. <laughs> no person does that. Yeah, you look at the whole word and then you say the word, but not do, do, so it's totally, it's weird. I don't know, it's, it's not working. Well, and then since then, the spelling problems has increased significantly from in, th in that time, 10% in 1999 to over 50% in 2005 and up to now. So this shows totally that phonetic reading and writing is not working. But what made them introduce that, implement that into the school system. Yeah. So if there would be no reading and writing problems in school, that would mean to the dyslex dyslexic associations and their therapists, they would be soon out of business, which they probably didn't want. And unfortunately, and that's the bad part about it, out of my experience, they have a large, very large influence on the Ministry of Education. And that's not only in Germany, that's also in Switzerland. And I believe that's a worldwide association and, 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 and da da da. Yeah. So, and maybe, Jenna, you know, also, I don't know how, how, successful you are to bring your uh, teaching and what you believe and what you do into dyslexic associations, uh, seminars or summits or whatever. They, they don't invite me because they know if the school would do it, yeah, then as I said, they wouldn't get any um students anymore and i think this is I, this is also true for self-directed education full stop um you know this is this yeah. is i think what we're seeing is that there is a very large industry uh, around education the way that it is done now there are a lot of uh, economics involved and I think the heads up for parents is we need to stop believing that our child's best interest is the focus and when there's a conflict 
between our child's best interest and the education industry's best interests, we need the courage to actually stand up for our child. And that's also okay. why we create events like this. That we can get the word out. We can also help parents to network and find the support that they need that you can actually step up and support your child, whether your child's staying in the system or whether you're going to be able to help your child escape the system, you actually need to stand up and help set your child free. Yeah. Are we going to Max. questions, Max? Max, your time. <laughs> I think like like one, one thing uh, out of the experience, I'm from Luxembourg and in Luxembourg, there is like an enormous problem with reading and writing in schools. And Luxembourg has has the distinction that that we are multilingual by default, but I see that like the 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 solutions proposed by the ministry are actually like what what you are telling about Nikolai like like phonetically and now they are mixing it up with even more languages. So so the solutions are then okay then then we then they will do alphabetization and uh, with with French now. So you have the option to choose your first language and and that will solve magically then all the problems. But but it's like really torturous in school at least in my experience like to listen to young people read they are forced to read aloud and it's really really slow and yeah and it's strange and it seems to me that like this this fanatical approach plays a big part in in that at least that makes a lot of sense do do any of you have have any um experience like with when it comes to multilingual settings? Yeah, of course. I teach, or I have been teaching for a while in Oroville. I don't know, that's a big uh, spiritual community in uh, India, south of India. And there live people from really all over the world. And I was teaching in one of their schools and the children learned their uh, English, of course, then they have their own language, maybe they're from Sweden or whatever. And they learn also, it's Tamil, it's Tamil Nadu, so they learn Tamil Nadu. So they have at least three languages. Most of them have a fourth language also, because, however. So the, the concept is the same. You put all the, the words, the written words underneath each other. Yeah. So for example, what I can visualize right now is flower. Yeah. So I see the flower, fleur, fiore, plume in Deutsch, and that's it. So you, you have the, the whole thing in front of you, and then you can just read it because you also get the, the tone in it. So it works. For, from, for all languages and you do it. And if the mind is used to do it, it does it anyway for, with all languages. There's no difference out of my experience. Um, so I just want to comment. I was just checking the participants. I was hoping Piotr was going to be here from Poland. He's had a very interesting experience with his own son who was dyslexic in Polish. And he took him out into self-directed education. And the son promptly taught himself to read in English <laughs> um, successfully. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think because, again, he didn't have the same, like, maybe the negative associations that he'd built up and the stresses. Because matched level of effort, as I was saying, I think I've seen is so important for, for dyslexia that they not be trying too hard or feel that the task is too difficult to have too much of a mental block about it. And that was also where I was interested to see in your book, um, uh, the importance of relaxation. So I was just seeing that um, Olive also has a comment she wanted to make about the multiple languages. Um, could we unmute her again? Yes, I think you, I think you just have actually. Okay. Um, I totally agree with what Nikolai says. But I also discovered during my work that the, there is something called orthographic depth of a language. And English has a very deep orthographic depth, which means that what you hear is not the same as what you write. And whereas something like Spanish has a very shallow orthographic depth, and I think Italian is actually an exemplar language that is almost exactly the same 
you write down what you hear. Actually, now, Finnish is Finnish is exactly. Yep. You say and every so, every every letter. So yeah. teaching phonetically is completely different in Spanish, Italian, and Finnish than it is in English, and people are not accepting that. And interestingly, when Nicolai said he got the education department to agree to visualizing words, and then they changed all of a sudden. I think I was about four years behind that. And exactly the same happened to me, but I never got them to sign up. They just changed it. It had to be phonics only. And the word only came in. And that's made the situation, in my opinion, considerably worse. Joe asks, are there resources to help us work with children to imagine the words, spell backwards, or other techniques for teachers or parents trying to help a child who we suspect may have dyslexia or whose brain may not be ready, but the child really wants to learn? So I think the answer would be um, by um, my companion's book. He's got lots of um, uh, guidance for you in there. Um, that would be a very re uh, good resource. Is um, this the answer? Can you ask him if this is the answer? Is that I a good answer to your question? I, Mark, Max, I did. He is looking for for materials to that, help. Yeah, that the child is able to visualize, or is that what to say? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, my book <laughs> will help. <laughs> it's it's a it's exactly written for children. It's written in a child language, so every yeah. step is written down how to do it, and you mm -hmm. find it. At Amazon. We'll also put the link on the recording description. If you're mm -hmm. watching this recording, you can go and have a look at the description and many links yeah. will be in the description. Quite a yeah. few links. Yeah. So there's another question. Jade um, asks, my nine year old child has physical reactions to occasional reading practices such as tearing up, twisting bodies, complaining her legs hurting. Uh, um. I believe she is in true physical pain associations to reading efforts. Do yeah. you have any suggestions or recommendations? Yeah, you know, I think we're going to have different recommendations here. I, you know, I can't help saying uh, if you can possibly take her out into self-directed education, I would highly recommend that because it sounds like she's getting traumatized. And if she struggles with other things, with other demands, yeah. Um, having such a strong reaction to reading practice can also come along with other neurodiversities as well. Um, Yeah, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to recommend? Um, of course, I don't know her and uh, different avenues I know. I would say to bring something new into that. Um, is the child really in a safe place with you as a parent to be totally honest what is going on with him yeah because if the child has the feeling that you want him to do something yeah then okay. he maybe finds different ways to get around and maybe she said yeah, i have pain or this or that i don't know if that's uh, relevant for you but we said already everything else yeah relaxation mm -hmm. and uh, self-directed uh, education and so on and so on yeah but if you do all of those things and the child gets still sim symptoms by re learning how to read and write, then maybe double check if the child feels some pressure in some way and tries to use that to get around. Yeah. Olive also gave a practical um, tip saying, make sure she's not looking down, uh, read signs up on the wall to start with. That's something you could you could try. Yeah. Stephanie is asking, is the damage to self-esteem the most concerning part of this labeling? Yes, yes. And that's where I think also the positive dyslexia movement is quite important, that children can see role models 
saying, I am dyslexic and, and look at me, I'm Richard Branson, I'm, you know, whoever. Uh, I think that's quite important is being able to claim the talent side of the profile and understand that your struggle with reading is really the smallest part of this. And it's just such a pity people are making such a big deal out of it. Well, my experience, to put a different aspect, uh, aspect of that, is if the ch child starts to believe he is dyslexic, <laughs> then he starts to believe he's not able to use his mind or her mind to be able to read and write in the right way, to learn this certain mindset, yeah? Then yeah. it gives up <laughs> and that doesn't need to be. So agreed, your average child in self-directed education will not discover that they are dyslexic. Mm -hmm. They will just learn to read a bit later. It's so not about later, I, uh, sorry, but just to make yeah. sure, it's not about put it a little bit later. No, it's about finding the right the, the, the right teaching matter to help you to explore which part of the mind you need to read and write. And then it, you can do it in any age, any time, and of course, in his own uh, tempo or way and so on, of course. Always the same, same self-directed uh, education is the base, right? And the second part is to have the right uh, mindset. You can learn that and then do it whenever you feel like doing it. But it doesn't help to put it in in the future, out of my experience, because in the future you still need to find the right way how to how to use your mind for reading and writing. Yeah. So Peter Gray's um, discovery is that the average age for a child to learn to read in self-directed education is eight and a half. That's the average, and it can go much higher. So um, my concern is that if we are going to start imposing, making sure the child is using the mind the right way at six. Um, we're going to be creating pressure um, and that isn't going to be with consent. So there's really no rush in self-directed education. As I say, my main concern is that not every kid can get into self-directed education. Not every kid can escape into self-directed education. So we do need to actually have assistance for kids who are under pressure um, and we need to have assistance for those kids in self-directed education who have started to experience pressure and want to relieve it. Otherwise, we can wait, because what's the rush? It's not about exposing. That's not what I'm talking. It's to give the child the information. He needs to know what to do when he's when the child is writing. I'm not exposing it. I'm. That's what I tell the, the parents anyway. I said, okay, tell him, here's a way how to learn, read and write. That's the way how to good spell it, do it. Yeah. Use it whenever you feel like doing it. Yeah. So it's not exposed. It's just the information like you inform your child about uh, to prevent it from any dangerous situation. You will not say, okay, go over the street. Even there's a, it's a car coming or something like this. Yeah. Inform it's the information. Hey, Here's the information, the way, da, da, da. I think I made myself clear. Yeah, look, I mean, I think you and I are working in different, um, in different spheres. So our basic approach is going to be different. Yeah, okay. Taryn, I don't know if I, I'm saying the, the name yeah. right, but now my child read when he was two years old, diagnosed with something called hyperlexia. He's now 11 and still can't write. What do you think? <laughs> they always need some boxes to put the child into. <laughs> it's like, okay, sorry, I'm not judging. I'm, it's just, okay, now we need a new box for those, for this child. Be happy he's, he's doing it. Yeah, I don't need a box for that. Yeah, it's like uh, saying he's super intelligent. He has an IQ from this and this. The IQ is also very limited to how you approach the child to do this IQ test and so on. 
So Taryn could also use um, the method in your book to, to strew to her son, to say, this guy says he's got a way for you to learn to write. Would you like to give it a try? That would be a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Or when you feel like trying it, when you feel like trying it, this guy's got a way you could have a look at and see if it works to, for you. Exactly. And he can read the book himself. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Jones um, is asking, so my, my children have never been to a mainstream school. My oldest child would likely be considered gifted and talented in a school setting. He taught himself to read fluently at age three and always seemed to naturally know how to spell words. My second child is likely dyslexic. There is only 18 months between them, but I have often wondered how much of this dislike of reading and writing is to do with him comparing himself with his brother. He is now 12 and still has little interest in reading and writing. Do you think sometimes even completely SDE children might be held back by a sense of shame? I've tried to build his confidence in other ways, but he will generally look for creative ways around reading and writing rather than tackling them directly. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So this is one of those situations where, you know, I would suggest having the conversation with him and saying, you know, on the one hand you say, you know, it's absolutely fine if you don't read yet. Um, and you want to give him role models of people who started reading much later. Some people in our form of education start reading at 14 or 16 and it's absolutely fine and they catch up and it's wonderful and you don't have anything to be scared of and you don't have any hurry. And if you start feeling frustrated and you want to do it, um, there are people who can help and there's methods that can help. So anytime that you want to tackle that, let me know and I'll, and uh, you can try some out. Yeah. Then yeah. They do need to know that there are options. Of course, when one, when the brother is good and then the daughter, whoever it is, gets the, the, the experience, it doesn't work in the same way, then of course, this creates some conflict. Um, maybe to give a different perspective, <laughs> to give a different perspective, not to say all the time the same. Uh, maybe ask the brother if he could explain her or him a little bit in detail what he's doing and how he's doing it in his mind. Yeah. And maybe you as a parent can support that in helping him to find out the, 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 the son who is good. Uh, what are you doing in your mind when you see this word? Are you seeing that as a mind picture and so on and so on? And then maybe the other child is trying to do the same. Yeah. So because the brother is just good, but nobody knows why. And the other child doesn't know why. And that's not helping at all. So at the moment, the child finds out what the the brother is doing in his mind and you as a parents support him with all those knowledge you get from here at the moment, then maybe the as a child is using it and it becomes better. My one flag on that would be we need to be very, very careful that we don't give the message, oh, wouldn't it be great if you did what your brother did? Because that That's, might be uh, the core exposing, of, the of course. Yeah, so one would have to be very careful. Of course. That's hmm. always the same thing. Not exposing, just just saying, okay, da da da, yeah, and um, without any pressure or anything. Of course, that's always it's not working. Exposing in anything, it's not about dyslexic or it's anything. The moment you get exposed, and the child is dependent on the parents, on the, the adults. There's no way around it. So the child wants to be. Oh, hold on. The child always wants to, the parents to be uh, happy. Mm. If the, the parents are unhappy, the child automatically, that's what I'm saying out of my experience, maybe there's some uh, uh, scientific proof also. If the parents get unhappy, the child always thinks he made something wrong. So if this runs through the mind, then yeah, 
just creates a lot of difficulties. So my book is not practical. My book documents my journey into understanding all of this. My book is really useful for the parent getting their mind around this so that you can relax and you can stop being worried because, um, you know, as my companion is saying, uh, if the parent is not happy and worried and stressed that the child is not reading, the child is going to pick that up. And then the child wants to want to please you rather than they want to read. And that diverts the energy into all kinds of motivational problems, um, which are not going to help them relax and learn to read. More what questions? So Jade is, has a follow-up question. Um, my child might not be ready for the self-directed reading uh, neuro neurologically, but mm -hmm. she is very motivated to read and want mm -hmm. to be able to read. This gap might be causing her emotional and physical pain in reading practices. How old is the child? Nine. Should be mentally ready for that out of my expense. So then probably something to do would be to have the conversation with her and say, look, not everybody's ready young. It's fine that you're nine, but it looks like you're struggling. Do you want to take a complete break from this and forget about it for a while? And if we can make that possible, I don't know if it's possible for you to do that. If she's got to stay in a mainstream school, then you can't do that. Then you want to present only the second option. Otherwise, present both options. Would you like to take a break or um, would you like to try this other way that uh, we found out about today? This guy's got a book and... Um, we could try that because he says that lots of kids struggle when they are taught like you've been taught and the problem isn't you, it's the way that you've been taught. Um, so if she's not in mainstream school, then the question would also be, you know, why is she feeling so much pressure? And to first try and reduce that pressure, to try and take a break, take the pressure off, um, let her relax, let her explore other things that she enjoys so that she gets back into a positive self sense of self-esteem. Um, that her core needs are met, her need to feel competent. She needs to do things that she is good at so she can start feeling strong and positive and I can. She needs to get that I can back into her body. Um, her autonomy so that she feels she has a choice about what she spends time on instead of she's always reacting to pressure from other people around what she thinks she ought to want to do. And her relatedness that she knows that she's unconditionally loved, unconditionally valued, and it really doesn't matter to anybody what she does or doesn't achieve. And when her core needs are all met and she's relaxed again and she's ready for a challenge again, um, then you could say to her, look, when you feel ready for it again at some point, then let us know and then we can explore this other method together. That would probably be the suggestion from me. I don't know. Do you have another suggestion, Nicolai? Mm, I think I said everything, yeah. So I think this is a good place to to end this conversation. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody in the chat for all the questions and for everybody that participated. And uh, thanks, Nikolai. Thanks, Jana, and also Olive for for this. I find found this a very encouraging, and I hope this this will. Um, help people to get another perspective on yeah. this topic and let's explore this and yeah and change change the conversation about it and i have one request there have been some amazing experiences shared in the chat if um you are at all willing or able to go to the recording as soon as um, we send the link out and put those comments in the comments that all the people on YouTube who view this later can also see the experiences that you've been sharing. That would be great. Because this is really ultimately about a community supporting a community. It's a very lonely thing when you feel like you're a parent struggling with your child alone and people need to know that there are others with them out there and learn from each other. Yeah, I would second that. It's, it's really great. This is supposed to to start a conversation and if we can like continue the conversation on our youtube channel and on other platforms and share it with other people i think we can uh, yeah we can make a difference thank you everybody thank you <laughs>